And so family, uh, meet me in 2 Corinthians 10. We're still there. Uh, we're going to be hanging out around the fifth verse, but for those that were not here last week or were not logged on last week, if you don't mind, I want to give them context. So we're going to read uh, the entirety of the second uh, section, 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5, in the New International Version. This is what the Word of God says. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, uh, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, have dominion as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Uh, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive. Here we, that's that, yep. That Pastor Chris is like, yep, because he knows. That's the word right there captive. I'm going to get there in a minute. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. The message translation of 2 Corinthians 10, the third through the sixth verse says it this way, the world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse that's why we have to do part three for every thought, emotion, and impulse into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. For a couple of moments this morning, God wants to talk from this thought. It's the thought that counts. It's the thought that counts. Father, have your way in the name of Jesus. Help us. Humble us. And mature us. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. It's the thought that counts. How many people did your thought recordings this week? How many people did your thought recordings? Okay. How many people were surprised at what you saw? How many people were, you don't have to be afraid. How many people were surprised? How many people were concerned about what they saw? Okay. So some of you guys are concerned, but not surprised. Y'all know y'all pastors a, a psycho, like I'm a whole full therapist, not a life coach. No shade. My point is I've been to school, okay, licensed by five states. So you were concerned but not surprised? It was the opposite? Okay. Were there certain times of the day that were more concerning than others? Okay. Were you surprised by what times of day the thoughts were coming that were a concern? You were? After a while? After a while, you're saying you weren't. Okay. Do you want to know what's going on with the thoughts? Okay. So let's get started. Wow. What an assignment. 
y'all are laughing, I need your prayers. And I'm not just talking about this sermon. Your pastor is always going to be transparent. It's a lot pastoring this generation. Okay? Do you all want to receive? Oh, are you saying that or is your heart postured that way? Don't answer. Do you hear what God is saying to you? Because he knows your heart. And I can pick it up a little bit as well. But with whatever posture you have, do you know that if a, a, that much is postured, that's enough for him to do what he needs to do? That's the good news. What a mighty God we serve. Okay. Remember back in the day you would have TV shows that would say last time on Family Matters, right? Well, last time on True City Sunday, God reminded us that Christianity is not a weak faith, right? But one of power and might and strength and boldness and that we are called to wage war, right? Against the forces of darkness and that that battle is fought on the battlefield of our minds, our minds, not other people's minds, but our minds with the weapon um, of unruly, untrue and ungodly thoughts. That's the enemy's weapons, unruly, untrue and ungodly thoughts. Write that down. We're note takers here. What are the enemy's weapons? Unruly, untrue, and ungodly thoughts. Okay? And on this Mother's Day Sunday, all across the country, there's going to be gifts given to mothers as a show of appreciation and love, correct? Yeah, there'll be gifts that are a hit and some gifts that may be a miss. But all mothers will respond universally by saying, thank you. This was so thoughtful. Because regardless of the size of the gift, track with me, or whether the gift fits, the reality is it's the thought that counts. Let me prove it. This popular phrase, it's the thought that counts, denotes that while I'm being handed what you're doing, while I'm being handed what you've done, while I'm being handed, happy Mother's Day, what you're saying or what you have purchased, that's not fully what I'm receiving. Nor to God, it's fine, is it the most important thing that's being received? To God, the flower is not the important thing. The gift is not the important thing. Nor is the happy Mother's Day statement the more important thing. So then your hallelujah verbally may not be the most important thing. Uh, but what I'm really receiving uh, is the undercurrent that the action, the statement, or the gift is carrying. An undercurrent that is the thought that fueled the intention that bought the gift. Somebody say it's the thought that counts. People don't discern actions. And people don't discern speech. What you're discerning is the thought behind the action and the thought behind the statement. Uh, that's where the invisible realm resides. Uh, it's what the world means when they say energy don't lie. We call it discernment. The world calls it energy. Same thing. And remember that God said last Sunday to suspend your discerning of the thoughts and intentions of others if it is that you haven't even begun to explore the health and God-obedient thoughts in your own mind. 
So after God proved last Sunday that our actions have their genesis in our thought life, he concluded with instructing us all to turn our attention to the landscape of our minds to intentionally track our thoughts for seven days. Why? Because it's the thought that counts. And remember that we said that the truth is the mind is the devil's playground, but it is the believer's battleground. So here it is. We're starting as we pick up in our text uh, with the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church at Corinth. For those that do not know, we're in this particular passage found tucked within the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians that we take note that Paul was intentionally, right, remember choosing to use militaristic language in order to convey that what he's about to expound upon is so serious that it's likened unto waging war. Uh, Paul says, listen, church at Corinth, remember, listen, true city, yes, we're called to fight. Yes, we're called to wage war. However, remember last week, Paul says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. So Paul says, church at Corinth, true city, wage war first. We dealt with this last Sunday by demolishing. Remember, we broke down the word demolish, right? What is the purpose of demolishing something so that it cannot be brought back to Okay, the barrier strongholds, right? Uh, we talked about that, that is fortified around your mind so that you will be free to receive the transforming word of God. That will in turn change your thinking and thus change your behavior so that it's more like Christ. Why? Uh, so that your behavior represents, represents Christ, not you representing Satan. The stronghold is around your mind uh, so that the truth of God's word can't penetrate your mind. You've been trying to change your behavior and God's trying to change your mind. Your behavior gets its instructions from your thoughts. You've been unsuccessful in changing how you act because you haven't changed what you think. So Romans, here we go, 12, 1 through 2, New, New Living Translation. This is what it says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, here we go. One text we said, Paul said, I beg you. I'm not writing you, Corinth. I'm begging you. That's what he said in Corinthians. Now, in Romans 12, here goes Paul. He's pleading. I plead with you to give your bodies. That deals with behavior. To give your bodies, your behavior to God because of all he has done for you. Mm. So then in praise and worship... Could it be difficult for you to praise because you haven't given your body to it? So then we have to drill down. We got to press. We got to till. Tilling what? Surrender. Mm, is right. Okay? Because of all he has done for you. So then if I haven't given my body, my behavior to God, then what do I think of what he's given to me? So in the prayer that I just prayed, that I don't pray my own mind prayers, God said through humble us. Because are we in a posture where we just, we expect to receive God's blessings, like breath? Because if you were grateful for it for real, a hallelujah will come out just a little quicker. Okay. He says, uh, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, your bodies, the kind 
that he will find acceptable, not the kind that you think is acceptable. I'm coming back around there in a minute. This is, am I in the book, Dominique? This is truly the way to, uh-oh. Now what are we going to do, Kyron? Because I thought worship was What is worship? Is it what you do when you turn on music in your house? Because God says giving me your body, your behavior, is the way I want to be worshipped. We were excited when we launched the church that God was maturing us. We have to keep that same excitement when he comes to prune us so that we can mature. It's easier to be immature than it is to be mature. But he says, let them live a, a, a holy sacrificial life that's acceptable to me. This is truly the way to worship him. Verse 2 don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now, we have to get that before we start the series on ambassador. How? How are you going to be an ambassador when the ambassadors from other nations come over to this nation and they continue to move according to their nation? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world because you're not from here. But let God transform you. Let me stop. Let who transform you? You've been trying to do it yourself. It's not going to work. But you won't surrender to allowing God to do it because you don't want to change. So give me a want to. Yeah. But let God transform you. Let him into a new person by changing what? Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is what? And, and. So again, Paul instructs us in the first half of verse 5 of Corinthians chapter 10 to wage war by demolishing arguments. Have you ever argued with your own thoughts? I mean a full-on battle. How many times have your under unruly thoughts won? Mine won all the time back in the day. I mean all the time. And I did their bidding well. We demolish arguments. God doesn't want you arguing with your thoughts anymore. He wants your thoughts to obey you. But I, we got to wait till next week because it's too much. That's next week how to make your thoughts obey you. Ah, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. The Message Bible says it this way. First, macro level, macro, watch this, macro. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. Macro, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. This is a powerful statement. Uh, in that it's exactly what it means to be prophetic. Hmm. Prophetic doesn't just mean thus saith the Lord. Ah, ah. It means to speak truth to someone or something that's in power. 
Mm -hmm. It's a call to challenge wrong mindsets uh, and corrupted belief systems uh, that don't line up with God's truth. It's what the prophet Amos declared to Israel to get them to repentance, saying, let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. It's what compelled Reverend Dr. King to declare the very same words uh, to the wealthiest nation in the world uh, in order to demolish their philosophies of discrimination and mindsets of demonic racism. It's the call uh, for us to stand up in 2021 and wage war against our modern day warped thinking and this hypersexualized, money hungry, ego driven, power thirsty culture. It's the call to speak against the mindset of a greedy person and say, no, the Bible says the blessings of the Lord maketh one rich and he has no sorrow. It's a call to speak against the mindset of elitism and say no the Bible said God does not show favoritism even to the great Paul says wage war true city demolish the anti-God thinking of people even if they're your crew Demolish the anti-God thinking of culture. You don't post it, but you like it. Oh, gosh. You don't put it on your page. You're smart. But you know you can see the likes. And you only like what you agree with. <laughs> we demolish the anti-God thinking of nations. And we do it by teaching, preaching, believing, speaking, and living this. Because if we teach it, we preach it, we believe it and speak it but don't live it, then the teaching, preaching, believing, and speaking goes out the door. Whoa, Pastor Kay, how can we believe it and not live it? How can you? How can I? It's possible to not live that which you believe. Ooh, it's tight in here. But it's right. Okay, so that was macro, Whew. the culture. But now God's going to go micro and deal with us. Now second, which this is why we had to do a part three, because the Lord is like, they will shrivel up and die. So just give them this little part. And a part of me was like, thank you. They're going to leave the church. Too much truth. I'm not concerned who comes and goes. Because all the blood is on Chris and I's hand. We must preach the truth. Yeah. Woe to us if we do not. So now second, the micro level, watch this. Lastly, Paul instructs us in verse 5 to do what I love the most. And this is what Paul says. Take what? Oh. Every thought, make it obedient to Christ. First, we're going to deal with this word captive, and we're going to be done. Taking some, <laughs> what just happened? You're not ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but your future is ready. Your future, and if I, the way that things change for me and Pastor Chris is that it was taking us too long to get to our future. So we said, bump this, and we started going God's way. How bad do you want your stuff? It's fine. And to those that have it, you don't have peace. 
So that's not God. Okay. Take captive every thought. Taking something or someone captive is a concept taken from military conquests. It's when what is, watch this, seen as an enemy has been captured, confined, put in restriction, and dominated. That's what it means uh, to take something captive. It's something that I see as an enemy, so I capture it. I confine it, I restrict it, and then I dominate over it. When something or someone was not in line with the governing rule, they would have to be taken captive for they could not just run around all willy-nilly and out of order. Sometimes you were captured, confined, put in restriction, and ejected out. But sometimes you were captured, confined, put in restriction, and dominated. Why is that important? Some of the thoughts may not leave as long as they're dominated. So Paul says, I have this thorn in my flesh. I think I'll, we'll talk about it. I'll add that next Sunday to Sharon. To buffet me. I ask God numerous times to take this thorn. Chris, we never think about the thorn being a thorn. I have another theological surprise for you next Sunday. What did you think the thorn was? It started as a thought. And there are some thoughts that you will spend too much time trying to get out of your mind instead of making it obey Christ. And you'll lose the war because you don't have strength to fight what you're supposed to be fighting, trying to get out something that is a thorn given by God. You have to get to a, but his grace, he said, is sufficient. I'm not taking that thought. Because if I take it, I won't hear from you no more. You're afraid of the thought, but I'm not. Even when you don't have control over it, I do. And you're spending all your time trying to undo your flesh. It's here. But greater is he that is than my flesh that is in the so thorn. You and I are just going to have to learn to live with one another. But I've still captured you. I confine you. You stay right there. Don't run around. The Lord's not going to put you out, but don't you run around. Don't you make a move. Don't sneeze. I know you have to stay here, but I'm tired of you skating around. Stop and don't move another further. Strategic warfare. So, uh, but do you want the first revelation uh, that God gave to me on Thursday morning? as to why we're not taking thoughts captive. Because remember, this whole thing I shared with you started with me saying, God, this is so basic. He said basic. (laughs) How? They don't have the basic. 
which is why they're, the miracles, the signs, the cancer being dried up, the people, it's not happening. Loan, $100,000 loans being approved, it's not happening because you don't have the basics. And then you're in a series called Dominion. So I said, God, okay, why aren't we taking our thoughts captive? This is what he said. You'll never take anything captive that you don't see as an enemy. And for many of you, uh the thoughts that you haven't been able to take captive, that need to be taken captive, you can't take them captive because the thought is really not at odds with you. Oh, God. For some of you, it's at odds with what you believe but not what you live. Uh, the seeds of your life experiences to date mixed with culture, uh, mixed with who and what you've opened your gates to, uh, have caused you to come into agreement with what is an enemy to God. And what the enemy is doing is trying to get you to agree that something that you used to know to be an enemy is now your friend. God wants it taken captive, but it's become your friend. And who takes a friend captive? So if that's you in certain areas of your life, the first thing you have to do is decide to agree with Christ. Ah, uh, take captive every thought. I'm off of that now. Here we go. Obedient to Christ. Obedient to Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. Paul here in Philippians 2 and 5 bids us to mind. Have you ever thought about mind your business? Mind. It's strategic warfare. Paul bids us to mind uh, the things which the Lord Jesus minded, uh, to love what he loved, uh, to hate what he hated. The thoughts, desires, and motives of the Christian should be the thoughts, desires, motives which filled the secret heart of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We have to strive to imitate him, to reproduce his image. And it starts not with the outward, but you thinking how Jesus thinks. You have to decide in whatever area of your thought life that you're finding a little bit of difficulty in conquering. In that area, do you agree with Christ concerning it? Because if you don't, you won't take captive thoughts that you're in agreement with. Even if the thought opposes you, and even if its intent is to produce behavior that produces a life that intends to bring you harm by your own hands, the enemy's thoughts executed by your hands. Thoughts, invisible realm executed by your hands, visible realm. It's how he gets into this realm. His thoughts, your hands. So this week, God showed me, Brittany, an open vision of a battlefield. And those on the battlefield, it was as clear as I was standing on it. Those on the battlefield were standing with arrows up and drawn, ready at God's command. There was an army on the other side that opposes God. It's a battlefield. People are all over God's battlefield. Uh, Arrow up and 
being drawn, ready at his command. But I looked, Kyron, and there were some people throughout the battlefield on God's side that were standing there physically, but they weren't in the posture of the others. I saw it as clear as I was standing on the battlefield. They were just standing there. Those around them, arrows up and drawn, ready at his command. They're standing there. And I asked God, why don't they have their bow and arrow raised? And God said, they're in agreement with the other side. I fell on my face in my bedroom. Fell down to my face. I said, God, what? He said, they're in agreement with the other side. I said, but God, they're standing on you. And he said, they're standing on my side, but they're not in my fight. Have you become friends with what opposes God? Because if it opposes God, no matter how nice it may have been to you on occasion, no matter how good it may have made you feel on occasion, its intentions is to oppose you because it opposes God. The thoughts that you haven't been taken captive are the thoughts that have become your friend. And you know that it's harming you more than it's helping you. But in order to capture it, you have to break up with it. So that's what God has to say today. It's the thought that counts. Because we don't take captive a friend. So God said, daughter, just stop there. Because they have to choose a side. Dominion by way of strategic warfare. So the first thing you have to do, which we're going to do in this week, that's about to begin, is to take those thoughts that you took the time and you, you, you wrote those things out, you, you journaled those thoughts out day by day, time by time, God says, I want you to go back through that list. Don't add new thoughts to it. Remember, we're statisticians now. We're going back to our first um, bit of data. And he says, this week, I want you to begin to pick apart the thought, thought by thought. Now he said, not regarding what thought is for you and what thought is against you. He said, don't do that. Don't look at your thought, thought by thought and say, is this thought for me or is this thought against me? That's where we're missing it. He said this week, go thought by thought and say, is this thought for God? Or is it against God? Even if it's your friend right now, make the markation of whether or not it's for God or not for God. How, Pastor K, chapter and verse it. Transforming lives through the truth of God's word. Chapter and verse your thoughts. Thought. I'm never going to finish this certification program. Google, what does the Bible say about finishing? 
Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. The race is not given to the swift nor to the strong but to them that endures to the end. I'm never going to finish this certificate program. I might as well just quit. Galatians 6 and be not weary in well doing, for in due season, Amplify at just the right time. You will reap a harvest of blessings if you don't give up. That thought, I'm never going to finish this program, is in opposition to God. It has the potential to become your friend because you're tired. God knows I'm trying the best I can. Because being tired will make something your friend. It'll make you quit assignments. Ask me how I know. It'll make you disobey God. Ask me how I know. But nevertheless, this has to be taken captive because I'm tired, but it opposes God. He didn't start me on this track for me to not finish it. He's a finishing God. Oh, I want to do the clothes I have for next week right here. Did it just see Jesus' thoughts in the Garden of Gethsemane? I think it's sounding like they're not going to appreciate this no way. and came down here. They don't even notice who I am. Oh, I know he had thoughts because he was man and God at the same time. If there be a way, let this cup pass from me. That statement, Jimmy, came from a thought that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane. But then he took the thought captive. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, be quiet, Dominique. I don't think the thought lasts. I think he went to Golgotha with the if there be another way. Even though he got to a nevertheless. The reason why I think that happened is so that he would give us and pay for our ability to dominate our So stop beating up on yourself. Stop beating up on yourself. Jesus didn't ask once. He asked three times. And that's what we have recorded. There were probably more. When they tried to throw him off a cliff, I believe he said, let's talk about this. When the religious leaders said that he was the son of Satan. And these were the teachers in the temple. I believe then he said, let's talk about this. But he found a way to take his thoughts captive. Why? Because they didn't agree with his thoughts. I only do what I see the Father do. My meat is to do the will of the Father. 
Father. You have to get to the point where your meat, what you eat, what gives you life, what sustains you, what keeps you energized is the will of the Father. So, in order for us to walk in dominion, God has to excavate the world's kingdom out of us and cultivate his kingdom within us. The word cultivate means to prepare, develop, and mature. 1 Timothy 4, 15 through 16, message translation, cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep, keep at it, okay? Who's going to continue in strategic warfare this week by examining which thought is for God and which thought is against God? Whew. Let's pray. All eyes closed. God, you are readying a people for kingdom dominion in the earth. We recognize and surrender to the truth that you can't be revealed through us if our minds have thoughts that aren't of you. Continue to demolish any barrier that's been erected to keep the truth of your word from taking root in our minds and help us to agree with Christ so that we aren't merely standing on a battlefield but we will in fact be waging war until the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our Christ. Mature us, cultivate us, prepare us, and ready us for battle, but also for victory. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Okay, so next week, we will have the conclusion of this matter where God is going to show us what to do with each thought that we take captive. Amen? And I have a revelation of connection to an entirely, entirely separate scripture that's connected to 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. How many people are excited? Y'all excited? It's, it's good, right? Tight, but it's right, right? Okay, awesome. So listen, we want to invite you um, to hang out with us this Tuesday for Truth Talk Tuesday. We're going to do part two of our Invisible Realm series that we're walking through this month having to do with angels. And so make sure that you either hang out here at the studio or that you log in online right on Facebook this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Truth Talk Tuesday is what we call our midweek Bible study. And again, we want to say happy Mother's Day to every mother that's in the studio and every mother that is watching. We pray that you have an absolutely beautiful day. One day is not enough for you to be honored, but on this day we set aside time just to simply say thank you. And so happy Mother's Day. Everybody standing all over the studio. And now unto him. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power forever and ever. Somebody say amen. Glory to God. Dominate your week.